Backstage. All right, we are live on our YouTube live stream backstage where we get to just kind of talk off the record a little bit, although everyone's watching, so I have to yeah. be careful about <laughs> not Off all the of record that. in about a month. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of curious, like from a law enforcement standpoint, standpoint, is it the same as education where like as the weather gets warmer, the craziness kind of comes out <laughs> a little bit more? I don't know if you see it in the <laughs> later stages of law enforcement too. Yeah, people tend to get a little antsy and eager to get out and get active again. So yeah, we see stuff leave the houses and go out into the streets. Maybe and, it was yeah. always happening behind closed doors, but we see a little yeah. more cabin yep. fever and all yeah Correct. people are like okay it's great it's warm. Yeah. i mean i yeah. wouldn't say it's exactly warm right now today it's like 20 like, something <laughs> i know yeah. it's just sunny so everyone's tricked into thinking it's warm. yeah oh i noticed they didn't do the ice out this year because it never really iced <laughs> over the river yep. which uh it, you know that's one of the fun watertown unique things they used to do a car you remember the yeah. first year they throw did, a like, car out in the river and dumped a car <laughs> I don't know if it was the environmentalists that were like, hey. Oh, no. <laughs> that was carefully controlled so that all those environmental things were removed from the vehicle first. And Already, just yeah. a sh- Just a hulk. And a didn't shell. they, oh, like, yeah. have a nice good good gauge wire on it so they could yeah. just, like, drag haul it, it out? drag it out afterwards. And, you know, it's completely environmentally friendly, trust yeah. me. Yeah. So then why don't they, I mean, where's the car? They just ran out. It's, like, too expensive to do all that, probably. <laughs> it's cheaper to just dump that sign down. But uh, yeah. they didn't even do that. They just, like, traveled it around to different parking lots. I guess yeah. it kind of ruined the effect. Yeah, <laughs> so I guess. <laughs> the one problem with the ice out is you do have to have ice. ice. Yeah, I know. So. It really wasn't that bad of a winter. No. no. Unbelievably good winter. It's so El Nino yeah. is the right. reason. It's not global global warming. It's El Nino. Got and it. trust me, next year you won't be talking about global warming. <laughs> 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 so these things just go in a cycle. But, uh, man, I've been looking forward to – being able to have you on the podcast uh we've known each other a long time and uh, you know this is a this is an awesome opportunity thanks appreciate God's that you with some some cool upgrades to the uniform i see you mm-hmm. got your stars embroidered on yeah. now yeah so that's the chief insignia right chief insignia is kind of a each department does their own thing. Yeah. I just decided one star was plenty. Some have three or four stars just to <laughs> yeah. do it. But one like star's they decide how many they want to put on them. Pretty much. Tell them otherwise. <laughs> it's <laughs> not like the Marines. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Like, I suppose Watertown, you know, like doubles in size, you could get a second star, you know. Yeah, it's, it's based on how many people are beneath you and whether they have stars or not. Well, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Nice. We've got captains and sergeants, so there's no other stars beneath me. So I just like give me one de- star. A deputy, deputy, deputy chief. Assistant or chief might yeah. have. Maybe mm. that happened. Well, we do have an assistant chief, but he he wanted just the words assistant chief on his lapel to make it simple. And so we stayed with that. Yeah, it's accessible. Yeah. yeah. Well, it still looks cool. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> it's still what I'm going for. <laughs> <laughs> the look. <laughs> you know, I, I get to get out the medallion at graduation. Oh, yeah. You know, yes. and I, yeah. I feel like that's a cool piece of bling. You know, we should have that out more often, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. You know, just Harkens so people back know what to, they're dealing with. You yeah, know? that's right. It's <laughs> the big hey, guy. Hey, <laughs> I did break it out to India, so uh, that was an interesting TSA experience because <laughs> my bag, I kept it in my, my carry-on because yeah. I wanted to keep track of it. You never know what might happen to your bags that you mm-hmm. check internationally. So coming back through security in Abu Dhabi, they recheck everything, and my bag gets pulled over, and I'm like, I know I got everything out of there, like yeah. all the laptops and cords because they're very particular about that, batteries, everything. Like, man, I pulled all that out. I had two bins worth of electronic equipment yeah. that was already out. And sure enough, uh, he's he's like pulls over, a, you know, another guy and they're puzzling over. You can't see what they're looking mm-hmm. at. You know, it's the backside the of the monitor. Mm-hmm. And finally he comes over and he goes, what is this? And he turns the thing around and I see this and I'm like, ah, I don't know. I mean, it was weird. It was like this, like this nine inch just solid blank disc. round disc. And I'm like, I don't know. And then I go, <clears throat> Oh, I know what it is. So I told him, I said, you're going to be amazed. I said, so I reached in. I said, you ready? Are you ready? Ta-da! <laughs> this gold medallion. And he's like, what is that? I said, it's not real gold. Don't worry about it. It's not valuable, but this is just for my college. And he goes, okay, man, you know, go on ahead. <laughs> so, he thought it was foil-covered chocolate. <laughs> yeah, he was hoping, baby. He was hoping to confiscate that. That's right. So anyway, that was... Uh, I, I had forgotten all about where I'd put that until he showed up on X-ray. So, <laughs> gotta be careful. I bet the guys in Milwaukee probably recover all kinds of interesting things at the. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> the People TSA. leave a lot of stuff behind. You know? Yep. I remember a local gun group was upset 
because they had kind of changed the rules. They used to say in Milwaukee at General Mitchell, if you accidentally walked through the scanners with a gun, that they would give you a chance to take it back to your car and put it in the car. Mm. But the new sheriff after Sheriff Clark, who was you know pretty pro two way, um, changed that and said, "No, we're going to go ahead and arrest you." You know, at this point, <laughs> you're literally trying to bring a gun into the restricted part of the airport, even if you were a lawful concealed carry. Like this is a no firearm zone. Can we agree on that at this point? Yeah, and, it's probably yeah, good. I think so. Plenty of signs up. Yeah, but the gun guys, man, they, on the forums, they were just mm-hmm. incensed. They couldn't believe that this infringement. And I'm like. I don't know, man. I mean, you know, how clueless do you have to be in this day and age? And uh, it's not so, like a passive act, you know. Like you have to after that, strap it on, you know. I, well, <laughs> they, they were arguing if it was in your bag, you might forget if that was your normal bag that you carry. Oh, in, sure. And then you just happen to be going on a trip quick, and you might. I'm like, uh, I think there's a lot of responsibility comes with exactly. carrying a firearm, and one of them is. You know, knowing that you're carrying a firearm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's where it starts, right? And the threshold for the arrest or the consideration of an arrest is probable cause. Did this person probably violate the law? And that's where we are with that. That probably they should yeah. have known better. Plenty of signs. Plenty of yeah. Like, oh yeah. Background on. Is that. there somebody so, in the world today that knows doesn't know you're maybe not yeah. supposed to bring a gun into the terminal? Uh-huh. <laughs> did the did the long line you stood in beforehand where with like, like seven so different take warnings? Out a million, yeah. You can't take fingernail clippers, but you thought that 357 would be all right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> so, I don't this know. is I don't not a hard one. Sympathy on that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I don't want him to put the guy in jail forever, but. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. Slap yeah. on the wrist might be appropriate yeah. at that point. Yeah. Yeah, for All right. Well, hey, let's get started with the, the podcast. This is good. You're listening to On Mission with Dr. Matt Davis, a podcast designed to explore the personal mission of everyday leaders. Hear from men and women who are making a difference in their corner of the world and discover what keeps them on mission. Welcome to On Mission with Dr. Matt Davis. I'm Jonathan Sheely. Our guest today is Watertown Police Chief Dave Brower. Dave and his wife, Marcia, have three children. Dave worked on a farm from a very early, early age. His favorite meal is an excellent prime rib, medium rare with grilled onions, with a loaded baked potato with corn on the cob, ranch salad with giant croutons, yes. finished with some French silk pie, uh, washed down with two or three glasses of cane sugar Mountain Dew on ice. Okay. He enjoys shooting sports, video games with his kids, board and card games with his family and friends, and watching crime, history, and science documentaries. His favorite sports team is the Vikings. The Packers are a second close. Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate it. Thanks for the chance to be here. Man, I am looking forward to this uh, conversation, and you can Thank order you, for me on the menu <laughs> any yeah. day, man. That is like a perfect order. <laughs> Although I do have to ask, there, there's a cane, pure cane sugar version of Mountain Dew. There is. Like Even Quick Trip to... carries it. It's much more mellow rather than the, uh, I don't know what the difference is, the corn syrup and the cane sugar, but it makes a difference for me. Maybe I'll I'm just too much of a... Well, given your, you know, your impeccable choice on the yeah. other, I feel compelled to you give, should, you, give you, you a might, shout out. Yeah, there's, a, there's benefit of the doubt, especially <laughs> yeah. with the inclusion of giant croutons. I'm with you, man. Yeah, like that was really That's specific. good. I like the giant croutons. You know, nobody likes a little croutons. Nah, you can't get the fork on there. Yeah, no, no. It's just, you're chasing the thing around the plate. Like, if it's not covered home. in croutons, it's not a good salad. <laughs> <laughs> Is it even a salad at some point? It's right. just like croutons with some lettuce, some garnish. I've never heard a more Midwest meal either. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. You, you would not do well in India all right so uh, <laughs> none of those things <laughs> well onions <clears throat> i think you could get, <laughs> get yeah, good onions. onions so man i i tell you what we uh we are blessed here in watertown uh you have been serving and protecting for a number of years and now being the top cop in town uh just means the world to us to know that you and your your team mm. are uh, patrolling and keeping us safe i know there's a lot that goes into that and just even as a Christian to be in that role, it's going to be a fantastic conversation this morning. So uh, before we get into all the details, though, Jonathan's going to hit you with kind of a big, big picture question. Sure. We would like to know what your personal mission in life is. Yeah. So I kind of break it out into three portions, uh, integrity, hard Mm -hmm. work, and competence. Um, Integrity is something that you can always have with you. I can always bring it with me doesn't matter my situation in life, doesn't matter whether I'm on the job or on my own personal life, can always be in control of 
my integrity. And that's something cops like a lot. Mm. It's control. We're very much about that to become actually a negative thing in a lot of ways. Sure. But in this way, it's something that I can control and bring that with me. Add to that hard work, just the honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Um, it's kind of kind of compares a bit there with integrity. Um, but once you bring those two things together, the things you can control, integrity and competence, and then wherever you are, wherever God has placed you, whether that's a business, whether that's a family, if you focus on those two things you can control, then the competency just kind of comes uh, organically, just part of that situation. Um, so that in the end, there's, there's no desperate need to be competent. Instead, there's just opportunity to have integrity and to work hard at things and let the competency come the way it should. Um, kind of keeps you in a position where if you're being promoted, if you're getting more responsibility, difficult things, um, it doesn't come in year number three when you're not ready for it. It comes in year number 20 after you've got a, a considerable amount of competency built up over that organic process in that time. Yeah, I want to explore each and every one of those elements because I think they, they obviously work together, but there's probably a hierarchy even within that, as you've already started to yeah. allude to that. But it really does kind of foundationally start with integrity. Mm. Um, how, how would you define that, certainly in your role as a policeman, but, but even beyond that, just as a, a believer? And we have so many different roles of life where integrity is absolutely key. Yeah, just kind of generally integrity is doing the right thing for the right reason, and especially being willing to do that when nobody's looking. And that's where it becomes really crucial to develop um, that foundation that then you're not accidentally doing things because you weren't planning well to do the right thing because you didn't think you were going to be seen. Instead, if you're mm. at the core um, doing the right thing when nobody's looking, then that becomes a natural thing when the chips are down, when stress is on the line, when it's a difficult situation when it really matters the most, rather than reverting back to your natural state of not having that integrity um, yeah. and getting caught and slipped up or getting caught up in the, the temptation to not tell the whole truth or the temptation to spin things the way it makes you look better and those sorts of things. Yeah, but probably the, the tension between integrity, as you've defined a couple times, in moments where you're sort of behind the scenes or by yourself, Nobody knows that you, th you think nobody knows. And <laughs> there's been plenty of cases where <laughs> yep. criminals have found out and more people knew than they thought. But that, that there's a tension between doing the right thing when it won't be found out, or I think it won't be found out, versus the reward of, of getting away with it and versus the maybe there's not seen as a tangible reward for integrity, you know, doing the right thing when – nobody notices well then what's the point if nobody's going to notice and reward me but is that a little different for the believer because we have a more eternal calculation of all that oh i definitely think so yeah um it's okay for the believer in my opinion to do things so that god is pleased so that god rewards um sometimes the believer will say well i gotta do things things just because it's what i do and i don't think that's scriptural i think god is very clear that he grants people rewards for the effort that they put into pleasing him. Um, so I think that makes a big difference where I can look ahead to um, things that are around the bend that I can't see coming and expect that reward from God. And I see that throughout my life a thousand different ways where he rewards me well after um, the good effort that I put into things. And I could have never seen it coming. And his reward is constantly way better than anything I could have planned for or dreamed of. Yeah. So to wait for him is... Uh, just a constant biblical theme, wait on the Lord. It's just over and over. But what would you say to somebody who says Christians shouldn't be involved in public service roles like this because you're just, this whole integrity thing is just a mask to impose your Christian values on people who maybe don't identify as a believer or as a Christian. Um, and, you know, is it sort of a... Uh, I, I'm always give you know, for me, the right thing to do is to just walk around with a gospel billboard all the time. And, and, uh, you know, imp are you trying to impose your values on someone else by doing the right thing? Or is it something more universal than that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's got to be some lines that you've really thought through there in terms of public service. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, give me some more. Give me some more of what you're, what you're going well, for. Well, I'm, I'm thinking... Okay, you're the chief of police, mm -hmm. and you're saying integrity is we need to do the right thing. Yeah. And I, I think 
you know, everyone from the Supreme Court on down to the the state of Wisconsin rule book for criminal justice, if there is such a thing, mm-hmm. and the sentencing guidelines and the, mm-hmm. the uh, exclusionary rules. I mean, all of those things would be codifications of right and wrong. But for the believer, there's also another set of right and wrong, which says that, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm serving a higher power and a higher authority. And there's a there's a whole segment right now, and I hear this a lot uh, in relation to politics, for example, that uh, Christians in particular shouldn't be involved in public mm-hmm. service mm-hmm. because, you know, somehow this the idea of Christian nationalism or we're trying to create the kingdom of God, you know, through policing or through this and that. But I, I've noticed over the years especially here in the Watertown area, you have had a good balance of, listen, we're here for, to serve and protect everyone. Mm -hmm. And it isn't really for us in our public roles to be imposing, you know, our Christian beliefs on someone else, but there's got to be a balance there between what has been defined as criminal activity versus balancing against the rights, even the rights of people who don't believe the way that you do. And that, that's got to be difficult to say, you know, the right thing for me to do today as the chief is to protect the rights of someone that believes differently than me to do something that m- my personal beliefs wouldn't allow me to do. You sure, know what I mean? Sure. Like yeah, in, in the, there's yeah. got to be a tension there oh, yeah. that yeah. you've, you've kind of thought through how to resolve that. Yeah, it goes back to our Constitution. Yep. It goes back to the, the, the foundation of equal protection under the law, that that protects everybody equally. So that every time I run into a situation where I don't particularly like a particular law, let's just pick something very minor. Let's say maybe I have an opinion that motorcyclists shouldn't have to wear helmets. But now my state says every motorcyclist has to wear a helmet. And how do I feel about enforcing that law on somebody that I don't necessarily agree with it? Um, And so as a law enforcement officer, every officer should be first and foremost saying my duty is to protect the Constitution because that sets the foundation for everything else that I do. And that equal protection under the law is there where if I'm not willing to enforce a particular law, then I should step away from being a law enforcement officer for that situation. And then each person, each officer decides for themselves, where is that line? For me, Mm -hmm. I have no problem enforcing a helmet law that I don't agree with. If we got to a situation where I was doing something that was clearly against God's word, um, wrong in the sense of I'm doing something that's a clear sin, Um, I'm not going to come up with an example off the top of my head because I I haven't seen one happen yet um, in in my situation, in my 20-plus years of law enforcement. Um, But I'm ready for that, to be able to say, okay, this is where I've got to step away from it and and stay true to my initial um, foundational requirement that Mm -hmm. I need to provide equal protection to everybody, regardless of whether I think what they're doing is in the best interests of them, for instance, um, we can go back to prohibition as an example of that, mm. where for some time there was a law that said you couldn't drink, and then all for years after that, there's a law that says you can. Um, I might have an opinion that drinking just by itself, especially drinking to excess, is a bad idea, but it's not in the law right now to go do anything about that and to prevent it right. in any way. Right. Um, so I certainly don't have a problem with somebody drinking or even drinking to excess. It's not illegal. Right. Um, of course, in your law enforcement capacity, driving, yeah, you, you know, you're looking more at the illegal aspects of where that goes yep. too far, Correct. drinking or operating a motor vehicle yep. or the fights yep. that people have or domestic violence when it when it has a different effect of that. Yep. And probably the closest example I could think of in our lifetime would be some of the rules and regulations that started to come down through COVID. And I was mm. thankful that here in Wisconsin, mm. we didn't have too, too many of those for too long. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of the states, you know, they were shutting down churches, mm-hmm. and then it was like on the law enforcement to tell a pastor that they couldn't open the doors of their church. And I'm sure a lot of guys out there were going, hmm, this is a conscience issue. I need to wrestle through and better get this, right. you know, better get this straight. Is this one of those, well, it's a law I don't agree with things, or is this mm-hmm. one of those I ought to obey God rather than man moments, you know, which yeah. are very rare, right. uh, hard to come up with direct examples in modern society thankfully yeah. um, but that's probably as close as it came you know and you had to like everybody else we were I, I felt like making things up as we went along just to address a massive threat uh, to I think all of our lives and livelihoods and you gotta remember that so much of that perspective is hindsight 2020 yep 
And in the moment when it's happening and yep. we're receiving very little information about this virus, we don't know mm-hmm. if it's going to be super deadly or slightly yeah, deadly. Yeah, exactly. And I At say people point, don't, they don't remember. Like, I'm leading yep. an organization here. You're working with the police. We're, we're working with the health department. They're telling us, you know, look, you could expect 40% of your workplace to die from this. That's what they were telling us at the beginning. Yep. How do that, you not take that seriously? Right. And as a worst case scenario, they're not telling you that that's for sure. They're saying this yeah. is a worst case scenario. And then they say, what's our responsibility as a health department so, to make sure the worst yeah. case scenario is handled? So they had my attention. I went to the meetings. I'm, I'm on every phone call. I'm saying, man, this is going to be, I'm going to answer to God for this, but I'm going to legally, I mean, I have a responsibility. That hit most of us really hard especially in those early days. And then, like you said, hindsight, we can thank God that that obviously mm-hmm. was not the result. Right. But as we, uh, w- what we had to go on at the beginning was very, very different than that. Yeah. And I think a lot of the churches felt that way too. Like, hey, mm-hmm. whoa, I don't want to lose the congregation. They, they, for a time, before the information was you know, a little bit better off, uh, said, okay, let's do Zoom, let's do limited sizes. And I was thankful that those uh, restrictions began to lift as more information came along. Yeah. Became a risk assessment sort of thing. Yeah. And mm-hmm. what do you want your government to assess your risk at? Do you want it to assess, yeah, that's probably no big deal. Go ahead and see what happens. Yeah. Or do you want your government saying, well, here's worst case scenario. Let's operate that way until we know we're safe. Yeah. And that's kind of where my mind goes as a cop, where I'm not just going to be like, I hear of some terrible thing coming to Watertown and be like, you know, I don't think it's going to be that bad. Let's not staff for this. Let's not prepare for it. Let's just hope that in hindsight 2020, no. we look back and find it was no big deal. It's <laughs> we tough don't for have me that to do. Luxury. <laughs> no, Lawyers no. don't have that luxury. Right. Law enforcement doesn't have that luxury. Nobody says, well, okay, best case scenario, you'll probably be okay. You know, like <laughs> nobody comes to a lawyer and asks about that. Nobody approaches right. law enforcement that way. You have to prepare for the worst, hope right. for the best type right. thing. Right. So I do have a question about, we're still talking about integrity. Mm-hmm. How, what's the role of emotion <clears throat> and time compression mm. when it comes to integrity. Oh, man. You know what I mean? That's going to be a four-hour conversation. Okay, well, I don't want to go good. four hours. <laughs> I like that. But, but I but, like it. I'll kind of try to summarize a little yeah. bit. Um, law enforcement, you see this. People fear this. It's a reasonable thing to be concerned about. Is the cop who's worked up and excited and mad and, and you have emotions perceived to be out of control? Officer? We do, yeah. Oh, not full RoboCop no, yet? Okay. We, no, we're not able to do that. <laughs> and the effort is to channel that emotion yeah. into fast, decisive action to protect lives and property. Do we do it perfectly all the time? Well, no. There's no job. I mean, can you imagine a fighter pilot? He's not going to do things perfectly all the time. He's fast, decisive action under huge stress. Going to make mistakes. We're all going to do those, those things. Um, so it becomes a, as much as possible, drawback, slow things down. Understand that very few cops are so foolish as to want things to move quickly. As soon mm-hmm. as we can get things calmed down, de-escalate, start the conversation going, that's going to give everybody time, and not just the cop, but everybody involved, to get that, mm-hmm. that uh, emotional level down. Once you've got some emotion in things, you're moving fast, you can make mistakes. So we do really try hard to, really, uh, to talk. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've had a 30-minute conversation with a drunk to get keys out of his pocket, to move his car out of the middle of the street, rather than have to go hands-on with him and fight him. And mm. yeah, I'm justified to grab him and put handcuffs on him and take his keys out against his, his will and use force to do that. But take a 30-minute conversation with this guy, and he'll give me the keys after 30 minutes. Do I have the luxury of time? So now that jumps into, well, what city are you working in? What's your situation? What are the calls for service? Mm. If I've got on my radio blasting shots fired down the street and i got to get this guy's keys out of his pocket fast changes that no, I quickly. don't I'm not able to do yeah. that now yeah. what what we would like to do is not often what we can do we're simply yeah. forced by circumstances to move quickly but if it's at all possible every cop wants to slow things down and add time and add emotion um, lessening to the situation to make I, it safer for everybody I think there's a general decision-making principle that you can apply there as well even in your line of work where things are escalated to life or death situations, but outside of that realm in all business decision making, in leadership decision making, Mm -hmm. taking time to reflect and to actually like, let's take stock of what the details are. um, When in reality, like we we, our initial emotions are going to cloud what's going on. Mm -hmm. It may give us an initial assessment of how serious it is, but that time is always going to make that decision better if it's allowed. 
Absolutely. If, if, if you have that luxury, you need to use it. Mm -hmm. The same thing with bringing the team concept in, that having more than one perspective on this and getting input from more than one people is just so helpful. Um, just something that I've learned very quickly as chief, that the more I can include more perspectives and more people in decision making, have conversations and not just go with what my head tells me. I yeah. end up making way better decisions because of that. And you have mm. people bought into it as well. Absolutely. As you collaborate. Yep. Yep. So that's kind of the integrity piece, and mm. that lays a foundation. And then it comes in to hard work. And mm. this is definitely building on integrity, because mm -hmm. if you don't have integrity, you're probably not going to have a hard work ethic. Yep. And yet this is something that's, frankly, kind of missing today in a lot of uh, scenarios, a lot of workplaces. And so that where does that ethic for for hard work <laughs> where does it come from uh and and how do you see that rewarded i yeah. suppose in in your profession or even as you raise your kids and see yeah. them sort of trying to develop that same work ethic yeah yeah it's man it's a big topic there's so many how can i create a situation where hard work is definitely rewarded as opposed to just skill um those kind of uh, back and forth polls because it's not just time polls. You mm -hmm. know, right. putting in time, clocking, yep. you know, put, cl uh, punching the clock type thing. Yep, yep. It's about commitment, whether or not somebody's going to stick with a task, um, how motivated they are to be creative and come up with new solutions. It's one thing to give a task to somebody and have them say to themselves, well, tell me how to do it and I'll do it. Or to be able to give a task to somebody and have them creatively come up with better solutions than I could think of. Um, those are the really crucial um, skills that I would love to promote and bring up to leadership positions. Um, but it, you're right, it's, it's, it's not something that comes naturally um, for most people. It's also something that is difficult to train and instill. So there's this real tension here with, um, if you want good people, the best way to find them, or the best way to have them is to hire good people. But how do you find the good people? How do you recognize the good people and know the good people? Um, but that's, that's key, if uh, the recruitment process, hiring process, having mm -hmm. a, good, a good solid method to find the right people is, is very crucial. Um, and then maybe the best thing we can do or maybe the, uh, for sure the foundation we can do is reward and keep um, those people um, happy, if you will, um, keep them paid appropriately, um, keep them included in the collaboration, um, give them a desire or a purpose um, build their desire by giving them a purpose towards the final solution, the final product, and especially giving them the credit for it. That's something that in law enforcement, part of that type A personality cop thing is to be a big ego. Mm. Frankly, we have a hard time setting aside what looks good for me and letting somebody else take the credit mm. for the team's success. Um, but as often as I can, I, I want to give that credit back to the people that put the creativity and the integrity and the um, hard work into it and came up with solutions. So that's something that uh, is, is integral to my mission as a chief is to do those things. You contrasted hard work. You said, I'm looking for somebody who's hardworking and not just skillful. Mm -hmm. How do you prioritize or weight those two things, hard work versus skill? If you've got a desire to always work hard and you've got a just a small amount of intelligence, then the skill comes naturally. It comes over repetition organically. Um, and I see that time and again where we start with a young officer who just has a difficult time with flounders. And in a year, and, and our FTO program uses many, many cops or law enforcement agencies use the um, learn by failure method where you're just, you got to go do it and you're going to do it wrong and we're going to tell you what you did wrong and you're going to do it again. And you're going to mm -hmm. do a little bit less wrong, a little bit less wrong until you're good at it. And it's amazing if people have the integrity to work hard, those two things, that with just an average amount of intelligence, you don't need to be rock, rocket scientists to become really skilled at a lot of different things. Even life and death situations and fast, decisive moments can be very well handled by most police officers that are willing to put in the hard work and keep that integrity high and then just let it organically grow into a skill. And that, I think, is kind of lending to your third element of the mission in terms of competence, Correct. which over Correct. time develops and is kind of proven both to yourself and to those around you yeah. as you're recognized to have that ability, yeah. uh, the experience factor. Um, 
in, in your line of work, though, I would guess that the competency clock sort of resets at each new level of Absolutely. promotion. Absolutely. <laughs> so <laughs> now you, you, you probably felt pretty competent where you were at. And now yep. it's last November, I think, yep. you're promoted to chief. Yep. Does the clock reset? And now yep. all of a sudden there's a whole new <laughs> competency to Absolutely. develop. Absolutely. When you promote from a detective to a sergeant, you still get to do a lot of the detective work, at least training people, at least encouraging them. You can still fall back and say, yeah, I'm not very good at sergeant stuff yet, but I'm still really good at detective stuff, and I get to do that every now and then. But it's not nearly as much. Let's say 30% is stuff you used to do and 70% is new. Promoting to the captain level, the next step up, now it's maybe 90-10. Mm. Promoting the chief becomes none of my skills are useful. <laughs> I've got to be a completely different thing. Oh, wow. Um, for instance, um, it's public speaking. The most, most cops become cops saying, I'll never have to speak in public. That's fantastic. I'd rather face the guy with a gun than go out in front of a group of 300 people and <laughs> talk that's about a statement. something. That, oh, that's, my. that's the reality. And so they learn public speaking is walking into a crowded bar with 40 people fighting and having command presence and shouting out orders and getting people to obey, that's public speaking. To does that cop. work really good as a chief? It doesn't work really well as a chief. <laughs> you, know? you walk into a meeting with the mayor. Yeah, right. <laughs> or even a meeting with my subordinates. Yeah. You start shouting out commands. It just does no. not work. And that's just one example of many things that police work, you know, interrogation, interrogating a, a suspect. Now I'm going to sit down with an officer who's done something wrong and do my, mess, my best to not do any of the criminal interrogation tactics I used to be really good at. <laughs> because this guy's not a criminal. He's yeah. just a friend and a colleague yeah. and mm. a subordinate and a cop mm. who did something wrong. Mm. So I've got to find new ways to interact and to deal with these things. So, yeah, it's a huge learning curve. I, I, I'm easily as incompetent as chief as I was incompetent as a brand new officer. It's mm. literally right back to that situation of feeling like, man, I'm doing everything wrong. And unfortunately, remember the FTO process? I got, <laughs> you, you were set up, you were expected to learn by failure. I don't have that luxury no. now. I don't get to learn by failure anymore. I literally, I do learn by failure, I do fail, and I do learn from that. But I don't have the luxury of having an FDO next to me saying, hey, it's okay that you failed on that. It's okay that right. you did that thing wrong and it's going to affect the department for the next two years. You, you just don't have that luxury. So I think the pressure is more as chief than it was as officer, and I feel that very strongly. Are there resources or support mechanisms for you as a, like a, a fraternity of chiefs or – other kinds of mentors or resources that you can draw from in that? Yes, and w there's a mentor program through the Wisconsin Chiefs of Police Association. I've met a mentor and had one conversation with him. He's available on my speed dial. I can reach out to him for these sorts of things. Um, great guy, uh, Nina, Police Chief Aaron is his first yeah. name. Um, really going to use him when those things come. But even more than that, I can depend on the people who have been there with, as my subordinates, my captains, my sergeants, my officers, mm -hmm. my detectives. Um, having that ability to sit down and talk things through with them is just so crucial and key. Well, I noticed at the reception when you swore in that you have a number of very senior guys that work now for you mm -hmm. that have, seems like, significant amount of experience and oh, yeah. may even be somewhat yeah. older than you. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that's got to be a good support system. But it's probably also an interesting new dynamic for you to yeah. have to try and navigate that part of it. Yeah, that part of it, you know, you, and I know what you're getting at, and that's really quite easy for me. Good. Because I've always had that idea, that team mentality. I really thrived when I was a subordinate every chance I got for a team mentality. So that's something I've been able to just turn up to the max is to bring everybody in and get input and again give back that credit when their ideas are what's being solved i'm mean, literally put in an email here's what we're going to do so and so came up with this idea it's a fantastic idea thanks for doing that and just give that credit as often as possible and now i've got people that are quick and eager to throw out ideas i'm very careful that no idea is a stupid idea let's talk about it and if everybody in the room agrees it's stupid then we'll stop talking about it but initially yeah. let's discuss this stuff there are stupid ideas there are stupid <laughs> ideas i agree <laughs> but i know metaphorically which right, 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 yeah. <laughs> let's get it out there let's and talk, talk about, about it exactly. maybe it will yeah. lead to a good idea exactly and that's really right. what it comes down to brainstorming wise right. mm -hmm. but i i think you're creating an environment that is probably pretty rare in the police command structure mentality 
Um, it is Maybe it's a more modern yeah, approach to it. it. I don't know. It really is. We're a little bit reluctant to catch up with the times, but yeah. it really is creeping in. To the, and and not more than creeping in, it's becoming the norm for a lot of places. Aaron, the guy from Nina, as he and I sit and we talk about stuff like this, mm-hmm. man, he's telling me stuff that he's doing, and I'm like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. He's bouncing stuff off me, and we're lockstep on this. So I don't think it's nearly as... Um, unusual as it was, let's say, a decade ago, maybe yeah. two decades ago. So from a criminal justice theory standpoint, there's the sort of crime and punishment. You know, these are bad people we need to identify and remove from society, and there's definitely right. some truth to that. Right. And then there's the rehabilitation side of things. You know, let's uh, do that. Then there's community policing, and there's lo- slogo- slogans and logo statements Buzzwords. like um, mm-hmm. serve and protect. Mm-hmm. And I think most of us understand the protect part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're the guys with the guns that protect us from the bad guys that are out to get us. And, you know, I hope there's not too many of them, and I hope that you guys are safe in doing so and have the skills and resources to do that. But what does that service piece look like in your mind as the chief? What is what is it that you're trying to accomplish from a force dynamic and and a culture yeah. that creates that sort of community service element? What does that look like mm-hmm. for a police officer? I mean, is it st- strictly walking old ladies across the street, <laughs> getting cats out of trees, or or what is that orientation? towards the community that a police officer should have. So, and, and just as mostly just brainstorming as I think through this mm-hmm. for the, you know, without a lot of time to think about it, protect and serve is a is ordered that way. Mm-hmm. Protect is a priority. Serve is if we have time for it. And it, that might be on a, in, a, in a traffic crash. Do I have time to walk the little old lady across the street and help her get through this? Or do I, do I need to deal with the guy who's bleeding in the car and, and during the yeah, crash? You got so I've got to prioritize this stuff. Um, but then the service, if we have time for it and we make it happen, and we do have time for it, I absolutely believe that, that then segues into the opportunity to protect, where we've got people that are willing to call us for help because we've served them in some way, in some small way, like walking them across the street or just having a conversation with them and getting to know them and letting them realize this is not just a situation where every blue uniform person is exactly the same as every other one. I can resonate with this person. I can get in, to know them somewhat. I remember one time back as a sergeant, I was driving around our Boughton Street complex, big buildings, lots of apartments, and I see a guy walk out, happens to be a black man, walks out, stands on his front door, and two little kids come out behind him, and he points, and they start running. And I'm like, I know exactly what this guy is doing. Those kids have too much energy. They've done something wrong. The same thing I did when I had my younger kids. It was like, <laughs> you guys are fighting too much. I need you to take three blocks or three laps around the block. Get back yeah. here, then we'll talk. <laughs> yep. And so I jumped out of my squad car, walked up to him, and he was a little standoffish. Like, why is this cop approaching me? It was after dark. He's kind of wondering, is he going to say I've done something wrong? And I walked up to him, stick my hand out, and say, I'm Dave. Are you having your kids run around the bl- run around the building to get rid of energy? That's exactly what I used to do <laughs> when my kids were your age, and we made a connection there. And he had a big smile on his face, shook my hand, said, "Hey, it's fantastic." Um, just a great connection opportunity mm. to serve simply by engaging with him on a human level and explaining, "I connect with you in this way, and I want to keep that going." Guarantee you, he's going to walk away from that situation talking with other people about this fun opportunity, this fun interaction he had with a cop. And that spreads. Just like a bad interaction with the cop spreads, a good interaction with the cop spreads. So the more we can serve in that way, the more opportunity I have to protect that guy because now he's going to call me. He's going to say, hey, I've got this fight with my wife. It might turn into me being arrested, but nothing really bad has happened. And we're constantly telling people, call us before it gets bad. We'll come over and we'll counsel and we'll interact with you and we'll separate things and nobody has to get arrested. And now he says, maybe I trust that guy enough he did connect with me. He does see me as a, as a fellow human being. I'm going to call before it gets bad, before it's desperate and I have to be arrested. And now that protection becomes more possible because of the opportunity to serve that started it mm-hmm. all. Is your role as the chief bringing you more so into contact with other political figures within the, the structure of the city and other departments and things mm-hmm. like that? Are you finding yourself more than before where it was probably most of your interactions were with mm-hmm. other officers and maybe the public in the yep. less fun <laughs> or ideal yep. capacity? So now you're interacting with the mayor and older people and going to city council meetings and representing the force in those 
venues yeah. as well as you know community businesses and things like yeah. that trying to maybe it's more pr than you <laughs> than you like could ever do before yeah. but uh how do you uh, wh- how has that changed you know in your role as the chief yeah that's a big part of it yeah. one of the big parts of it that we never had to do before prior chiefs before us just took that burden weight on themselves and in a sense, it was nice to be insulated from that, to sure. just go do our thing and enforce our laws and make our arrests and take protect that one people for the team. and that sort of thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, but with the team mentality, man, I want to involve those people, those subordinates. Um, if I've got an issue that I know I've got an expert and he's a detective, I'm going to bring him along to that city council meeting, have that conversation as much as I can. Um, so I'm not going to be as insulating a chief as prior chiefs, mm. but I'm going to include them and bring them on board and then those political figures, those uh, outside the department people get to know more of us, which I think yeah. is a fantastic thing. I, I'm not, no one person is a good representation of an entire group of 40 officers or 60 you know, total people. Um, so the less I can arrogantly think that Dave Brower is the face of the police department, um, the better it is for not only our department, but also the people outside our department to see and understand and know different people. Maybe you won't have a answer to this off the top of your head, but was there something that kind of jumped out to you that was surprising that you didn't expect about the role of the chief <clears throat> that you you maybe didn't realize that came with the job or <laughs> that, good or bad? I, I, I guess it could go either way as far as a surprise, but maybe something you didn't anticipate would be part of the, as big a part of the role as it turns into hmm. and I have to give that one some thought because so much of I really walked into it going I have no idea what this is going to be like and I'm preparing right. that way to not be <laughs> blank slate right to be as blank slate as possible can't be surprised I have no yep. idea what I'm getting exactly. into <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, yeah, fair enough but let me think hmm. I think the the time commitment hmm. and whether or not I can craft this chief's position to a place where I can better balance time off and time at work um, was it's it's more difficult than I expected, but I'm making headway in it. I'm only in month number four. Yeah. Um, months number one through three just felt like drinking from a fire hydrant, mm. just utter deluge of more new stuff that I don't know. And everything takes me twice as long because I or maybe three times as long because I don't know how to do it. So. Waiting for that. I've seen a little bit of a lessening of that. Hopeful enough to me. So, okay, I'm hopeful here. Um, I even took the afternoon off today, for instance. And I'm like, I think I can make this fit into my schedule. I'll well, I couldn't believe that you had the time to sit down with us this morning. <laughs> yeah, so that was a blessing. This sort of thing is, is a great a great use of my time. You know? So maybe that's that's something that jumps so, to mind. So that, that's a segue into probably a, a, a good topic for anybody who's going into any line of work, but in particular... Mm-hmm. criminal justice it seems like it's super hard on families mm-hmm. your wife is here she's just yeah. off camera and she's a huge blessing yeah. serves here at Maranatha and uh, we're we're thankful for that and she's obviously your biggest fan um, and I'm her I, biggest I'll, fan. I'll plan to just be number two you know you I'm never gonna <laughs> be able to be number one but uh, I'll, I'll go for number two uh, so, so you have a you have a wonderful family, mm-hmm. uh, a wife that loves you and supports you mm-hmm. in this, and a partner in that. Yeah. You're involved in your local church. You've you've carved out priority time, but you also have a massive job that will take every single minute you decide you're willing to give it, absolutely, and more. Right. You'll you'll every day you'll always go home knowing there was more to do, yeah. there, th- that there's more job than there is you. And that there was something else you could have done, something else you you'll wondered should have done, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so how how does the profession chew up families? It seems like divorce mm-hmm. rates are so high amongst law enforcement. At least, mm-hmm. at least that's my per- perception. Maybe mm-hmm. that's wrong, mm-hmm. but you've managed to navigate a career in criminal justice mm-hmm. and maintain a healthy home environment, raise awesome kids that are, want to serve the Lord, that are tenderhearted, that aren't let that kind of jaded, you know, that the, the profession tends to put a crusty exterior, at least on, on guys and even their families. And, and yet that's not the Browers, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so what, what are you doing differently? Uh, I mean, obviously the grace of God, but what, you know, what does the profession do to families and how can you guard, guard yeah. against that? Yeah. Um, 
it's God. There's no, I, I don't in any way look at my handling of this profession as having been in any way crucial or helpful towards the survival of my family. It is that damaging potential, that damaging of a potential, that mm. they're, it, in my own power, my own ability, no chance. It's got to be 100% God working. Mm. Um, and that speaks to the divorce rate, that speaks to the suicide rate, that speaks to so much negative that comes to law enforcement. Um, and it would be a deep dive to start talking about sure. all of this, um, but kind of the, the thing that affected me most negatively, if I can kind of go there with it, is the control factor. Is we are trained as law enforcement officers to quickly control everything because you don't know when this is going to turn into a deadly encounter for you or for that person you're trying to protect. So that becomes a trained, ingrained, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week method that cops become very comfortable with. And to not take that home to your family and use it on them is only by the grace of God that that can happen. Um, and that becomes something that God reaches in and either at the right time pulls that cop father, that cop husband, that cop wife, that cop mother away from those things or and and or he gives grace to the family to be able to survive those things and see past them and see through them and, and struggle on. So for me, it's personally for me, it's only by the grace of God. If it's I would be that divorced person, I would be that suicide person, I would be that terrible place except for the grace of God. I, I don't that said, there's lots of things that can be done that cops should do to help. One great analogy that I can think back to my earliest training in, in law enforcement is at Minnesota State at Mankato. Bill Lewinsky, great guy. You can look him up online, fantastic stuff. Google Bill Lewinsky. There's a plug for Bill Lewinsky. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, he taught us, he trained us. He had an entire course, a semester on police stress. And he required a 40-page paper for a three-credit class. Whoa. I wrote 60 pages. And he was Whoa. like, I'll take it. It was that good of stuff. One of his analogies was the guy who walks out on his way to work and reaches up and touches his head and touches the tree. And then as he comes home, he does the same thing. He touches the tree, touches his head. And he says, that guy is deliberately on purpose remembering that I'm taking off my cop hat and I'm putting on my cop hat. And I'm mm -hmm. not going to be a cop when I walk into my family. And that by itself, if every cop, regardless of whether they're leaning on God or not, if they could sh take that one little thing and make that real and make that happen, it would make a tremendous amount of difference. Hmm. Um, I did not all completely um, blatantly be honest that I did not do well at that for many years. Um, God reached in and got a hold of me during COVID. We mentioned COVID, mm. that I was out for three months with a serious brain fog issue. Hmm. probably going to be not able to return to law enforcement. You don't want wow. the guy with the gun in his hand to have a brain fog issue and not yeah. know what to do. Um, yeah. God healed me, got me right back into the saddle again at the very last moment when I was utterly destroyed and, and, and figuring that things were going to be no good for law enforcement. And it's been great since then. But at that time, he got a hold of me and said, my wife finally saw me in a position where I would listen for the first time in decades. And she said, you have major problems going on. And for the first time, I didn't try to control it. I didn't try to say, well, that's not right. No, no, here's where I'm doing fine. Here's yeah. where things are. Here's where you need to change. <laughs> for the first time, I said, you're probably right about this. Yeah. And I listened. And over the next three months of brain fog, I got right with God and right with my family and became a much different person. No, By no means doing great yet, but progress and steady progress moving mm. into that. that um, I remember that well, and mm. we certainly prayed yeah. diligently for, for God to help you through that mm -hmm. or redirect your career because that's what it came down to at that point and become a, a huge threat and yet um, it's hard to be the one going through that I mean a it's your brain so mm -hmm. it's hard to know if your brain's tricking you, yep. <laughs> you know, that's the hard thing you are reliant on someone else that you trust yeah. that loves you that has your best interests and you have to go with that you know version of reality instead of the one that's in, in mm -hmm. your, between your own ears yep. and that's really tough yep. But but also just to, to submit to God as, okay, this is beyond my control, and that's the one thing that you thrived on and been trained to maintain right. your whole career. Mm -hmm. So that had to be ultimately uncomfortable. And yet, do you look back on that and say, 
maybe in a strange way, I'm glad that happened because I'm a better person because of it, what God taught me through it. I mean, are you able to have that perspective on it? That's 100% the perspective. Wow. If it hadn't been for that time, I don't know where we would be as a family right now. Wow. So God really reached down and used that. Um, just got a hold of me. Hmm. And man, it's good to be got hold of by God. Hmm. It's really a good thing. I don't care how it comes, when it comes, what difficulty it is. It's always going to be way better around the corner. And yeah, it was, it was tough in the moment, but yeah, I would never trade that for anything. So a concluding question t- for me is, as a, a citizen, I can't be more thankful for the community that we live in that you and your team have provided to us. It's a gift. Um, having safe streets, having, having the ability to sleep safely at night, raise a family here from young age. My boys were little and and Watertown Police Department has taken, I don't know how many, you know, threats to my family, you know, mm-hmm. off the streets that yeah. I never even knew about. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so my perception of Watertown is it's this idyllic, wonderful town to <laughs> live in and grow up. Your perspective on it is, well, <laughs> at night, different things come out, you know, and, and there's there's other things that only your your team would know about. And so how can we pray for you and your officers so that we're diligent to maintain our side of that bargain, so to speak, Mm -hmm. that we enjoy from you, but how can we pray for you and for your team? Yeah. So come to a ride along with us. That's what I would absolutely recommend for everybody that wants to know how to pray for a cop. We have a ride along program. Most agencies do. Sheriff's Department on both sides of us, Dodge and Jefferson, have that as well. So spend four hours in a car with a But cop. then I might know more about the creepy things in the night, and <laughs> I'm a little to. concerned. <laughs> you probably, like maybe I'd be better ignorant. You're right. right. <laughs> but you probably won't in Watertown. We are pretty okay. idyllic. So okay. you'll probably go four hours and just have a traffic stop or two, but you'll get to know that cop a little bit and get to see how they tick and how to pray for them. Um, pray number one for safety, of course. Mm. That's an absolute necessity. We are constantly doing things that are dangerous for the good of other people. That's that self-sacrificial part of this this career that gives us great meaning. And at the end of the day, we, I didn't just get a paycheck twice a month and then made five million widgets with my life. I invested in, in letting other people go do those things that make them happy. Um, I One of the great sacrifices, uh, it's tough to explain, and most people don't, until you've ridden with that cop and you've talked about it with the cop for some time, the sacrifice of being willing to take the life of another person mm. to protect the citizenry yeah. is a really um, difficult weight on people's minds, on, mm. on officers' minds. So pray for that, that they and can that, survive that reality. That is not only a hypothetical thing, it's happened. And it's, yeah. and it's something you, as a cop, you are constantly on edge prepared for that mm. the entire time you're on duty because you're in a uniform and you got a gun there. And no matter what happens, it's on you to protect that person and make that split second high speed decision on whether or not to take somebody's life and never really be able to turn that off and really even off duty most of us are armed off duty most of us take that very seriously most law enforcement agencies expect or require sometimes their officers to take fast decisive action when life and death is happening even if they're not on duty Um, so it's really something that weighs on the officer all the time Mm. it's a reason think of it this way the executioner used to wear a hood so that his anonymity was protected, so that nobody knew who he was, so that he could just decompress and not be that executioner. We now have the reality of life and death decisions are made every day by our officers and no anonymity allowed. Sure. You have to be front and center when the camera And when the it's going to be up. micro-analyzed, probably video recorded, exactly. and you yep. know, second by second or even yep. more granularly analyzed exactly. and criticized. Yep, so pray for them to be able yeah. to, 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 to bear up under that strain mm. and not let that become a jaded thing for them, turning sure. them into a robot, turning them into a cynical person, especially as they go home and deal off duty with their family and their friends and their, their realities off duty. So those two things are the first things that come to mind, safety, of course, and then safety for their mental well-being as they bear up under the stress of being that level of protector for society. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time and investment in our community. I know that you've been on campus many times to train faculty and staff, mm-hmm. yep. and those investment times definitely were important in, in our careers as well. But thank you for your time he- even here on the show. Well, thank you guys for what you do. Thank you for being part of the community that cares, 
wants to know these things, wants to pray for us, wants to support us. That means so much. Amen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us today. On Mission is a production of Maranatha Baptist University. Subscribe to On Mission on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to leave a review as this will help other growing leaders find these conversations. For information about our guests, previous episodes, and general information about On Mission or MBU, go to mbu.edu podcast. Join us again next week as we examine what keeps